I wanted to start by asking you, what brings you in to talk to me today? It's like, I'm kind of embarrassed because I don't really know what to say other than like, well, Rebby asked me to, you know? Mm -hmm. And that sounds like so like flippant and it's, and it doesn't, I don't want to sound that way. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Sure. So, but I mean, Rebby has like filmed me previously mm -hmm. and um, like the footage that she has is, is pretty, some of it's pretty intense. Like she has me like right after I tried to overdose. So I was mm -hmm. like, I threw up in a bucket and like it was like, should we call like poison control? And she has another one where like, I had like this angry episode and I broke a, um, I broke my laptop. I just threw it on the ground and it was completely demolished and then like ripped off like a, a Van Cleef necklace. And um, so she has like stuff like that. And then it's not like I've made so much progress, but I've made, I've made some progress. I've had my laptop for a little while now, my new one. Good for you. <laughs> I haven't broken a phone in a while. And, um, and so I guess in one way, it's like good for people to see that you can make progress. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, I just want people to know that because I don't talk to, like, even my boyfriend doesn't know that I was diagnosed with BPD mm -hmm. and he will never see any of this. But um, how can you be so sure? I, I don't, I can't. And I really am worried about it, but I'm just going to hope he doesn't. Um, well, I find this fascinating because the way you're sitting here with me today is that I can't imagine that happening. Exactly, and that's my point. It's like yeah. I want people to see that like they have this idea of what, what BPD is or what mental illness is and all of these things, and it's actually sort of, I struggle with that because then when someone meets me, they have no idea, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that so there's this misconception of what it looks like, and it doesn't always look like what people think it looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I really want people to know that it, it doesn't fit into a box. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds to me like part of your reason for being here is that you are telling a story of your own self-improvement in the face of these really difficult and volatile moments. Right. I mean, that, I didn't actually like think about that until later, and only because my boyfriend pointed it out. But yes, that, I'm going to take that. Okay. <laughs> take a little bit I'm of gonna credit. I'm going to take that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, can you tell me how that exactly happened for you? How you went from being in a place where you're overdosing and breaking your computer to holding on to things a little longer without taking your feelings into action like that? How, what do you think's worked? I mean, I think when we get older, the borderlands, not to, not to call us borderlands, but borderlands, when we get older, we sort of have a better grasp of our of emotion regulation. And mm -hmm. it, that's been the case for me. And then also just I've been, and I said this before, like I, before I was a turtle without a shell, like quite raw, quite vulnerable, quite susceptible to anything. And it was just like everything was so painful. And now I have a shell and I don't know if that's age or experience or maybe just like a little bit of both. Um, like one thing I'm proud about with myself is that before anger was just like my go-to. Like I didn't really have any other mm -hmm. way to process emotion, so I would just be angry. In fact, I was always angry anyway. And then, but now I can like my and like now I can like cry and like feel sad. And before it was like just anger, just like this so much anger, and I would like break things and scream and yell and like tear at myself and like. Um, and then I would cry and feel sad, you know? Mm -hmm. But now I can feel sad, mm -hmm. like initially, which I, I think is an improvement. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. I think that is improvement in the sense that you went from feeling these strong feelings that you didn't have a good grasp on that would just turn into kind of angry action. Mm -hmm. And now you have a bit more a ability to feel your own vulnerability. Yeah, definitely. And some different ways in which that vulnerability feels to you, like sadness or yeah. maybe regret or anxiety or fear. Or guilt or something along those lines, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shame. That is, I think you're right, there's some maturational process about it, but it seems to me there's also some effort on your part. I mean, I did do DBT, so that helped. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't give myself that much credit, honestly. I do think age has a lot to do with it. Like, my mother was definitely a borderline, and she's so much... Um, she's not, you know, like... How so was she borderline? What happened? How um, did you know? I mean, I didn't know, and I, I don't think there's any way that I would ever know, but she was just, like, extremely vicious and very, um... I don't want I mean, I don't want to say these negative things and, like, and make them, like, these attributes of borderline, but she was such a vicious woman and like instead of like hugging 
she would like hurt. You know what I mean? So it's like, and like, kind of like I hate you, don't leave me, that kind of thing or whatever. And then, like all of those, all of those like cliches, like walking on eggshells. But she was just such a vicious, vicious woman, mm -hmm. and um, she was horribly mean. And that's a terrible thing to say about. I mean, I don't. I feel bad saying that. That's how I knew she was borderline. <laughs> no, but really though, she was just, she was- It makes sense She was me. horrific, like just horrific, like just such a horrible, horrible mother. And she never, she didn't have any ability to process her emotions and anger was definitely what she went to. Like there was no, there was no ability to anything else. It was just anger all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, so you could recognize that like you on some level, she was mostly feeling all her intense emotions through anger so, that she would express. So there was this, I was in Japan, with, I was in Tokyo, and um, there was like this, and I'd never heard of borderline personality disorder. Because I actually think it really hasn't really been mm -hmm. understood until, and this was in 2007, I believe. So this was a long time ago. And there was a Time article, which I don't even read Time now. I think I've graduated to like a, a little bit higher vocabulary. but. Um, and it was talking about borderline personality disorder and then there was this one sentence in there and it was talking about how instead of hugging they claw, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I just teared up because I recognized my mother so much like in this article. And that's like when I knew that she, I mean, you can't really diagnose someone else, right? Well, you can, but I can't. Um, that's when I knew that like that was probably what was going on with her. Mm -hmm. And so then when I was hospitalized for the first time um, and I had brought that up, like, I don't know if that's like how quickly they connected the dots, but they connected those dots, so. The first time you were hospitalized. Yeah. Was that when you tried to overdose or was it before that? There were so many, so many overdoses. So many. <laughs> one of a, for, yeah, one a of long many, line. One of many. So the first time it was like, it was so, like I wrote this thing about it or whatever. It was like basically like children's Benadryl and like that was like how I was gonna like, that's how I was gonna go. Like that's how I was gonna tell everybody how much I condemned life, like children's Benadryl, which weirdly like was effective at like making me super sick, but. Um, how so old were you? I was 20, 30, I was 30. Yeah, I was 30, so not young, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But you had children's Benadryl? Well, of course. I mean, I guess not, of course. I don't know why I had it, actually. You're right, yeah, I know I had children. And then after that, it was like, then, because I had this, in New York, I had this doctor that would prescribe anything I wanted. So then it was like Adderall, Xanax, whatever it was. Whatever it is that I wanted, I had it. And so um, that was just like an ongoing thing. And then I would like research how to do it and like it actually has like a pretty low like ability of like working it's usually like 11 percent of the cases and i was like this is going to take forever and so i like figured out like how high a bridge needs to be if i need to jump off of it which is 250 feet and then what kind of gun and like it's just stuff like that like i was obsessed with it so you were kind of honing your skills over that period of time like you started with something like children's yeah, Benadryl, exactly, which yeah. kind of now you're like, what was I thinking? That's but so none of it worked anyway. But yeah, right. exactly. Like that one was just sort of like so. It was just so. It was so dramatic, like in a cheesy way. I remember just like telling my boyfriend at the time, I was like, you're gonna watch me die on children's Benadryl. Like I'm like adding that last part, but it was so awful, and I feel bad for him for having to go through that. Well, I wonder if you can remember why you took the overdose, though aside from wanting to die? It was the holidays, which I don't typically do well around, and um, I was having an interpersonal conflict with him. So I don't remember what it was that happened, but like, and it didn't help that I, honestly, like I'd been out drinking and doing coke and stuff. So like, that didn't help, obviously. That makes you like more vulnerable and susceptible to like, whatever. And then, um, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't my best moment. Clearly. Clearly. And then I had to You go. got a lot better at these overdoses. I, I, but <laughs> these overdoses, I think that there are a statement you want to be dead. There, It sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, there also a statement, someone's hurt me. Or I'm hurting, yeah. 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 And is there always someone there when you do this? No, I mean, there was one time towards the end, towards the like last ones that were happening, um, I, was, I took like 
Lamictal is like pretty much impossible to overdose on, but like it like I don't I don't know if you know this or not, but you lose like your ability, like your motor function. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't like so I did that and something else, and I don't remember what the other one was, but nobody was there, and I didn't tell anybody. And um, I had this playlist that I would play whenever I was gonna like get myself like revved up for this like suicide session. Mm -hmm. It's just like this, like it's so not opposite to emotion. It's so like, I'm gonna dive into this depression. You know, mm -hmm. it was, it's actually called like Avec Cigarette. So it was like basically just sad, like, I think I even had like Les Mis on, you know what I mean? Like, oh, wow. I know, it was it was so ridiculous. Is it though? It, well, cause Les Mis is like the dad dies and like, you know, and I, I went to go see that musical with my, you know, I just had seen it like three times and like when the dad dies, it's like, it always is pretty acute. Like it, it's like a very, um, very, yeah. Sad. It was, so, but it's kind of, I mean, I shouldn't have deliberately put it on. Anyway, so I, I put that on and that was probably the only time where I didn't, where I know where you're going with this, where like I would reach out and ask for help, right? Mm -hmm. Or tell somebody what happened. Cause I never actually called 911, but I would always tell a friend or something. But that time I didn't. And um, VJ actually, somehow he just knew what was going on and he came over and I hadn't locked the door, which is, I don't know, but I was on the ground and I couldn't move. And um, and I remember like when I, cause I couldn't move cause I didn't have any like motor abilities. I didn't have like, I couldn't, I didn't have anything, the strength to like open up the door or call or ask for help or anything. And I remember just being there like incapacitated and being like, this is not what you want. Like this is not what you want. And I don't think I overdosed again after that. When was that? Maybe 2000 and 2011 was when the majority of them happened. So I want to say 2011. Mm -hmm. I don't think I did it again after that. Mm -hmm. It's a blurry, blurry recollection, but I really don't think I did. Yeah, so it's been about eight years mm -hmm. since you've overdosed. Right. And how did that happen? Oh, 2012, 2012, two, So yeah. it's seven-ish seven, seven -ish years? Yeah, yeah, a, a while, yes. Yeah. yeah, so in that moment you decided to stop doing it. Because it was, yeah, it was mm. scary. Scary to you. Yeah. And how did you s manage? Well, I went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah, obviously, they, they took me in. And then I was there for, it's usually like a one-week stay. I'm pretty sure that was a one-week stay. Um, and then I got out again. And then I wasn't better, but... And just eventually you just get better, I guess, right? Don't people just get better a little bit? Or do they just avoid, as I've learned from my last session? A little <laughs> bit of both. Yeah. I think there, there is something about the natural course of borderline personality disorder where you're right that people, I don't know, a kind of generic word is mature. Mm -hmm. And how much brain development goes into that, how much life experience goes into that, and how much just the emotion regulation mm -hmm. that you said gets yeah. better over time. Right. We don't know. Yeah. But I think that there is also sometimes some avoidance that goes into why people stop exploding in the way they do. So it sounds like the suicidal explosion stopped about seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And is that when these kind of outward um, moments of destroying your computer or doing something else angry no. got worse or was that going on all the time? That would have been like a really just pervasive issue throughout like I wasn't allowed to be angry when I was a child and I think that that actually is probably why it got to be so bad so I wasn't allowed to have like emotions or feelings or my mom would say things like children should be seen and not heard and so like even if I were to like like I just remember once like she just like beat me up in the car and I didn't know what I had done but basically like I hadn't clapped correctly or something. And it was just mm -hmm. sort of like, or yeah, it was that we'd gone to the symphony and like I hadn't like done it correctly. Like maybe I went like this and I should have gone like this. Something just really ridiculous. And, um, but I wasn't allowed to be angry and I wasn't allowed to have like emotions that I think like children should be able to have. So maybe when I was like on my own, then I I'm, like, it just got worse. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I'm actually not really sure, but that was you, always a problem. You are on to something. So back then, wh how old were you at that time? Um, that was like my whole childhood. Right. Yeah. But that memory, it seems specific. 
I don't know, I was probably, I was a teenager, so. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you felt? Yeah, I always remember that. Just like, like trapped and like mm -hmm. weak and incapable of like defending myself and just sort of like, yeah, just like, Something like that, like just like that. Like there was nothing I could do. I could really, literally nothing like I could do. Yeah, defenseless, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. How does that link up to the problems of anger eventually? You weren't allowed to express anger, but eventually you were expressing anger in all these ways. And it's that freeing. Yeah. yeah. There's something empowering about it, right? Yeah, definitely. You're right. Definitely. And it's not good that it's like linked with that, but yeah, definitely. And I was like, is it not good? That's a judgment, I know, but it's not good, I think. I know, okay. You I, just said a minute ago that you thought that it was kind of bad for you that your mother didn't let you express anger f because a child in yeah, that situation right. yeah, right. should normally be able to express anger. Or just an emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what I mean, They're just emotions. But yeah, I know you're right. It's There's gotta be like a healthy balance there. But is there something adaptive about the fact that you would let loose about this anger thing? Because I think feeling angry and acting angry, there's something pretty liberating about no, it. No, definitely, definitely. Like everyone likes to break shit once in a while. Do you? I do. When have you broke? Okay, sorry, we don't have to, but like, I don't. I, you, you know, actually one exercise I do with patients is that, you know these painted ceramics that kids make? Mm -hmm. I have about a hundred of them. Okay. And I bring them in, and I bring in hammer, and we whack them to death. Well, it is therapeutic. What do you think uh, is therapeutic about it? I'm not sure. There's a what release happens there. when you yeah There's release, a release of what? I, I don't know. If endorphins? I'm not really sure. Like feelings. Feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I like to do is take glass jars and throw them into dumpsters when they shatter all over the place. So what is it about phones? Like, I feel like I'm not the only one who has like this, like, it's always a phone that I'm breaking. Like, is You tell me. No, I, it's not just me though. Like I've been in like anger management classes and like they broke phones too. Like, is it what the phone represents? Like this communication tool? Like, is that what it is? I've gone through so many phones, so many phones. I mean, I just don't even get like a nice phone anymore. <laughs> That's pretty adaptive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do think you're right about it is that there have been many broken phones in the program that I run. Yeah. And oftentimes, more, probably more often than not, the thing that people break that's not the object I've given them to break yeah. on purpose is phone. the phone. Yeah. But I want to sort out with you, what, what are the kind of maybe functional or positive ways in which breaking things helps you emotionally? And where's the problem with it? Well, it's a release, like we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. It's a release. And it's empowering. And it's like a way to get back control, maybe? Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, there's something about putting force into something and watching it transform. Yeah. It's like having an impact. Yeah. And I do think it's true that a minute ago when you are talking about this situation with your mother, you felt like you didn't matter, defenseless, you know, and you needed to kind of protect yourself in a way. And I do think that sometimes the lashing out is this kind of available force of empowerment, mm -hmm. but there are downsides. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> um, First of all, the temporary lack of access to your phone or your computer. It's, it's crippling, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But what else about it is not working for you? Um, I mean, it's. I mean, it puts like a barrier in between relationships, right? And it's. This is what I I said before. Like, it's so hard to like fix these things once I've done this to them. You know what I mean? Like, not. I'm talking about the phone or the computer or anything else that I've broken. Like, it's just hard to fix a relationship because this person. Typically, the people in my lives have like almost like this, like they, they see me the way that most people see me. And then all of a sudden I turn into, um, this is gonna sound like a judgmental statement, but a monster. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's all, then it's all broken. And then they'll say things like, you're not the person I thought you were. Or 
like that you turn you're scary now or just things like that and then it's sort of like I understand that things are fixable at that point but it's hard and it's almost like I don't want to Mm -hmm. you know what I mean and then it's like I have to get them to understand like things I don't want to have to get them to understand does that make sense yeah it does about this issue of the transition between the the version of you that they think they know Mm -hmm. and then the monster that comes out Mm -hmm. What is it like for you living between these two halves of yourself? Like what happens for you when you're the kind of um I don't want the to person be the everybody Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be that person. But this other side that's so kind of pleasant and lovely and um apologetic, uh, slightly self-effacing. Slightly? Yeah. <laughs> What's it like for you in that state? This is how I want to be. Is it? Yeah, definitely. I don't want to be, like, I don't want to be, it's not like I would need to be perfect, but I don't want to be, like, I don't want to be the person who, like, breaks relationships or breaks phones or, like, I not like, I know that no one is perfect and I know that no one is as, like, as, and I know that we're all just sort of struggling and, you know, just barely making it. Um, I know that that's true about everybody, but um, sometimes it feels like um, I struggle with it a little bit more than other people, and I, I kind of just want to be someone who doesn't struggle with it as much. I can understand that wish, but you are someone who has to work harder to manage your emotions and how you express them and what impact they make on your relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there is this divide between this side of you that's so um, appealing, um, but kind of hidden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, it's true. And then this transition to what you call the monster, but a more like kind of naked expression of how you feel. So what happens when you actually, aside from the release and all these internal benefits of the destructive Mm -hmm. um, tendencies. tendencies. What is it like for you to be seen as that person that... It's horrible, and I don't want it to happen. What is horrible about it for you? I understand that it's horrible, but what exactly is it for you that bothers you most? Well, I I feel like I'm disappointing the other person. I really do. And it hurts a lot when they say things like, you're not the person I thought you were. You know, that kind of thing hurts a lot. And they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. So, but then if I was to like go into every conversation and just like be transparent and talk about like, but at the same time, I have cuts all over my arms. So I just kind of feel like people should automatically know that there's probably something a little, not to say unhinged, but like a little bit more um, unhinged. (laughs) I don't know. I just feel like I just try not to be that person and I don't want to be that person and I don't want to disappoint other people and I don't want to have to like I don't want to have to like I don't want to be that way I know that you're trying to get like something out of me and I'm sorry that I'm struggling but I just don't want to be that way I don't blame you but I do think there's something about not being what other people want you to be being disappointing it's kind of like clapping the wrong way at the symphony that really is painful for you. But it's the way you really are. Yeah, and I think right. that's the difficulty is for you to be yourself. You feel at risk, you know, at the mercy of someone else's hand that you can't quite control or... Do you think it's like that for everybody to a certain extent? I'm not, I mean, I don't know, I'm just asking. Like, do you think it is for everybody? Like, I know Everyone who has BPD or any, everybody? Everybody, yeah. I'm just asking. I honestly don't know. It's like a genuine question. I think question. that's a good question. Is everyone like that in the sense that they try to hide their true selves mm-hmm. to be more acceptable to others? Yeah. I Not think, everybody. You know, everybody yeah, else. I think there's some variation on it. But I think, like you're saying, it's harder for some people because the gap between who you really are and who you want people to see you to be is bigger. 
Yeah. I mean, if I were to go around being as like dysregulated as I probably am, or like, like I have such bad anxiety and it's already hard enough to like be around people, like to where like even my friends are like, you're a little off. You know, like, cause I, I start like, I just say weird things sometimes and people are like, oh my God, like just stop talking. Um, it's true. But like, if I, if I were to be that way, I would never be able to get a job. I would never have like any friends. And I would, I mean, I just, yeah, that's what I think. I think that those things would happen. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't be able to function. If you didn't have friends, you wouldn't be able to function. If I didn't have, like, if I weren't able to like, be like able, like I interview pretty well and like I, typically do well at work unless like things have like crashed and burned or like and I mean I don't I don't think I would be able to be a functioning adult I really don't yeah. and I, I need to be a functioning adult I mean I need to you get an A plus on that thought. I don't think I do but <laughs> I do need to be a function the desire it, is there <laughs> yeah I can see that I can see that I think that part of what makes you so interesting is that you have these different aspects to yourself you are a very likable person, mm -hmm. and there's a side of you that becomes unhinged. It's the side that makes you more than what other people want you to be, and it makes you the individual you are, and that's your emotional life. Yes, it's true you don't always manage your emotional life in a way that's optimal for others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you have to always make yourself optimal to others. True, but, okay, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but like, I mean, I, I think anyone who has borderline personality disorder can relate to this, but I've lost friends and I've lost relationships and I've like alienated people because of my inability to be this perfect person. You know what I mean? And I don't want that to happen. You know what? What? Me too. Oh, that's that's nice. That makes you feel better. Yeah, we all do that to yeah. some extent. And I think you're right. You're on to something about how people with BPD have the kinds of problems other people without BPD have, but, but more extreme. Yeah, magnified. Because I can tell you, yeah, I've sometimes had to say things or do things for myself that weren't acceptable to other people in my life. And sometimes you lose those relationships. Yeah. But it's a matter of feeling more, like maybe decisive and in control about it rather than it just happening yeah. to you. Yeah, that's how I feel like it is for me, but you're more in control of it. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm giving you credit here. <laughs> you give me a lot of credit when you don't give yourself credit. Well, because I, I, because I've lived me. I've lived me. I have pretty much. I have all the experience with me that anybody could ever need. I definitely don't want to like continue to lose like relationships. And even like if the relationship I'm in isn't healthy, like I would like to be the one who takes that step to be like, this is an unhealthy relationship. I'm going to separate myself from this relationship in a healthy, balanced manner. But it very rarely happens like that. It's usually just like chaos. And I really just don't want it to be that way anymore. So if I act this way, and I'm being honest, like if I act this way, maybe eventually it'll just always be this way. It's got better. It has, <laughs> I mean, I think you actually have some real understanding of these things for yourself. And it has gotten better, but I think you are right that you have a ways to go. Yeah, of course. Because I do think it is a kind of lifelong goal for all of us to be able to decisively say, this isn't healthy for me, and then kind of like package it up and yeah. tie a bow on Toodles. it and put it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's Toodles. the dream. Yeah. Rarely happens yeah. that way. Yeah. But um, I, I think the, the thing I want to ask you um, before we end is, in light of the, this progress you've made, going from overdosing to not overdosing, breaking things at your own expense, yeah. and driving away people that you actually need, mm -hmm. to not doing that as much. For, for a while. Yeah, as much. <laughs> yes. Um, what do you still think you need to work on? What is the biggest problem in your life right now? I mean, I wanna say anger, because I just, I didn't realize this as much until we had these sessions, not you and I, but the last two, like I'm pathologically avoiding it. Is that the right way to say that? Like mm -hmm. I am so scared of being angry that I will do anything to make sure that I'm not gonna be in a situation where I get angry. So what is that anything you do to make sure you don't get angry? Like people pleasing or like just avoiding 
certain conversations or topics or um, not asking questions about certain things or just like letting myself think certain things because I don't want to know the answer. Um, not, yeah, definitely not having conversations that I find to be um, um, likely to make you. Yeah, angry. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that when people realize something's a problem like anger, sometimes the most brutish way to manage it is to avoid it. Yeah. And that's a step in the right direction. It's just like if people have a problem managing alcohol use, yeah. they avoid it altogether. Right, right. Now, for someone who's emotionally sensitive, who hasn't been allowed to express emotions openly, this rarely works for the long run. Yeah, so I've heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some I'm people do things that kind of look normal to the naked eye, like sleeping a lot, taking naps, drinking, using Benadryl, actually. Benadryl is a big thing. You're like, why would you? I was like, yeah, of course I have it. <laughs> I like, Benadryl <laughs> makes everyone a little delirious. Yeah, I, I just was like, yeah, of course I have it. I didn't even think about that as being weird. Yeah, of course I have children's Benadryl. Yeah, I know. Do you still use it? No, no, I So don't. what do you do? in addition to these actions to manage all that emotion you're not expressing? Um, well, probably, I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I know that if I'm depressed, I'll sleep. Mm -hmm. And if I need to, like, if there's a definitely, like, if I feel like I have done something wrong or I haven't done something um, to the best of my abilities, like I, I definitely will sleep as mm -hmm. much as I can. Um, Do you ever um, use medications more than you're supposed to, or take? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about alcohol? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we've discussed this in the last session, but yes, alcohol too. But only when I'm like with people that I don't. Like only when it's like a social situation because I don't drink by myself and like when I'm with my boyfriend I don't drink that much at all and like I'll just have like we'll just have like one or two and then like that's it like it doesn't matter like where we are or what we're doing like I have no desire whatsoever to be excessive about it but like when I'm with people that like my friends or a social situation I'm definitely going to be drinking too much and it's not like too I'm, much it's not a purpose yeah too much how do you know well, I think the blacking out would probably be a big indication. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that blacking out? Just like not remembering. That mostly hope it happens in social situations. It only happens in social situations, yeah. Why is that? Because I have anxiety. Yeah, I have some fear anxiety. Mm -hmm. So Anxiety um, about the people? Yeah, like it doesn't, even if they're like a really good friend, like I get anxiety about hanging out with them. Um, yeah. That sounds really uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean it is, but that's just, I think I think a lot of people have that. A lot of people have social anxiety. I think mine is probably a little bit worse but um, than your average person, but I think that's something that a lot of people suffer from. Yeah. I do think that you will reach a fuller potential for yourself if you work out something about your fears about others and how you come across to them, whether or not they find you acceptable. I never, that's, that's a connection. I never thought about that, but you're right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> was that torture or was that helpful? That was so helpful, <laughs> oh my gosh. I just thought I had social anxiety because I have social anxiety. I had no idea that that's like the connection there. Well, of course it is. Well, I mean, not of course. Do you know how much therapy I've had? <laughs> well, this one was for free. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Revy. <laughs> thank you, Lois. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm like thanking the wrong person. I apologize. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I am very impressed by you. Don't be, but thank you for saying that. And, and that's fine. That's <laughs> for the record, that's another thing I think yeah. you need to work on is, is uh, Kind of that's deflecting awesome. credit from yourself. Because I have a feeling this thing that your mother instilled in you through her volatility is fear of having pride in yourself. Yeah, she didn't allow that. 
Yeah. And that's probably getting in the way of your asserting yourself in a way that would feel more satisfying to you. Yeah, I think you're right. Definitely. So um, I've found this a very um, satisfying conversation. Me too. I've gotten to know you, yeah. and I feel like I was fortunate to do so. That's kind. Thank you. And I hope this kind of helps you sorry, carry on my your... Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. That was super helpful. And I... Um... Thank you. I mean that genuinely. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yay! Kumbaya! <laughs> what do we do oh, now? Thank you. Yeah. Before we finish up, let's just do, roll a little room tone, which is okay. everybody stays quiet and we record for 10 20 seconds. <laughs>